we're starting the series on experiencing God. Uh, just for a little um, information, I, I tend to write devotions for the church. I will not be writing them during this next 12 weeks. I want us concentrating on experiencing God. So there will be no devotions from me. Uh, we're just going to emphasize um, this, this study. And um, it, it, I like Henry Blackaby, who helped write this and it gives to us because he, he looks at truth that we need to find out how to get closer to God. And he starts with this wonderful way of phrasing it. He, as Christians, we tend to ask the wrong questions, not out of any wrong motive, just we think it's the right motive. And Henry was talking about how we like to say, you know, what's God's will for my life? That's the wrong question. It's a self-centered question. It's an egotistical question, making me the center instead of him. I mean, we have churches that love doing it. Um, God wants you to be wealthy and never get sick. Who's the focus? God? No, me. I'll be wealthy. I'll never be sick. Me's the focus. I mean, we're looking at John 15, 5, where it says, God, Jesus, I am the vine, you're the branches, you remain in me, and I in him, you'll bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. Now, if we're going the way we preach a lot, or teaching a lot, is it should be, I guess, we are the vine and God is the branches, and he remains in us. <laughs> it's like, no, God's like, the correct question we need to ask is, what is God's will? Not God's will for my life, what is God's will? It sort of starts removing us as the center where it's all about us and getting to where it needs to be, God. Because he'll invite us into what he's doing because he's always working around us. He's always dealing with us. I mean, the seven uh, things that uh, Henry Blackbeard would go through is the seven realities, which is God is always at work around us. God pursues a continuing love relationship with us that is real and personal. God invites us to be involved with him in his work. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, in the ch and the church to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. God's invitation for us to work with him always leads us to a crisis of belief and requires faith in action. You must make major adjustments in, our, in your life to join God in what he's doing. You can come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. And the emphasis is always his work, his will, his way, not ours. And too many times we want God to work in our life, our way. And if we're going to be called by God, we have to be really ready to make changes. Ephesians 5, 15 to 20, is, it says, be very careful in how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I love that too. The days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the, what the Lord's will is. Not the Lord's will for me. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs. From the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what's really fascinating about this is to do this what he's saying in these verses require that we're in God's will. Now, as followers of Christ, we're supposed to be spirit-filled. And we're not very spirit-filled when people come up and you go to Christian, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm awful. I mean, I'm just a, chew a chewed toy for the world and the world's a dog. And I'm just being beaten up and it's awful. And like, oh, I thought we were spirit-filled. I thought when I'm in the will of God is... That's what we say. I mean, we, we're looking at Paul getting beaten in lashes and all this stuff, Peter in jail. How are you doing? Oh, just awful. Just, it's just so terrible. I'm just a chew toy for the world. No, we have Peter and stuff in hymns, being beaten, and then singing praises to God, singing hymns to God because they're spirit-filled. The problem is when we're in God's will, we have to start removing our will. And too much of our life is us. So how are you doing? I'm awful. I'm terrible. It's, 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 okay, sorry. I guess you're not spirit-filled then. Because it seems to be all about you and not God's will. And we cannot get to his will because I will tell you, if you are called to God's will, one thing that's going to be central to all of it, 
it's not going to be about you. It's going to be about God. That's what it's going to be about. And if, we, if everything's about us, and the world is, it, everything goes to us. God's saying, yeah, it's about, when you make it about you, you start your conversations by saying, oh, I'm terrible, I'm awful. You know, how's that working out for you? Would you like to start out with, how is it going? Fantastic. I, I was listening to Francis Chan. He says, I work it every day, waking up and saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That every day I wake up saying, I am your child today to do your will. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And he says, then I go into my prayer room. No, brush my day, I go into my prayer room. And I start praying. He says, but then all of a sudden I start doing the world thing. I start thinking about me and what I want and what I want to do. And Because Satan loves to come and distract. And if you're starting to say, holy, holy, and focus on God, he's going to come in and get your focus off God. And so I start that way, then my prayer room, then, then Satan saw it, I'm concentrating to focus on God. He goes, then I start my day, and then once again, it's becoming about me and not God's will. And it's, we get so focused on self, and the hard part is, and it's so hard to be a Christian, because when the world is telling you to focus on you, what you want, what you feel, what you think, then you're having a God who's saying, stop focusing on you, stop focusing on me. No, I'll, I'll give you peace, I'll give you contentment, I'll give you joy. But a major part of it that was focused on God, or God's will, is you're going to be incredibly inconvenienced. If you're looking to fit God into your schedule, you've already lost. We don't fit God into our schedule. We do what God schedules in our life. But, oh, I'm, I'm too busy. I just have too much on my plate. I'm retired now. I just, I just got to relax. And God's like, oh, really? So I'm sorry you have no time for my will, but your life is so full, there's just no place for me in there. As a pastor, as through the years that I've met with people and they're struggling and they sit down, and, and at times I, I dread these conversations because I know exactly how it's going to go. They tell me how difficult life is and it's going, and then I'll ask the question I got to know the answer to. But I ask it, well, tell me about your time with the Lord. What's your time with the Lord look like? Are you praying? Are you in his word? Are you spending time? Are you surrounding yourself with people who love the Lord? And usually it's no, no, no. And then I wanna, what I want to say is, and you're surprised you're having issues? Why are you surprised? You're not making any time for God. not spending your day with him, your thoughts with him, your prayers with him. Why would your life be going smoothly? You're asking God's will for your life. Well, could you just start with the praying and his word and spending time with them? God's will is really not too complicated. It's just looking for him and joining him where he's already working. Even as Christians, even churches, we all, oh, this seems like a holy thing to do. Let's go do this. And God's like, but I'm working over here. Yeah, but Lord, this is really a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, but I'm not working there. I'm working there. But Lord, this is a gracious and holy and righteous thing to do. And God's like, yeah, but I'm over here working. We like to think, oh, here's what God would want to do. God's like, well, you talk to me about what I want you to do, where I want you to work. There's a, uh, in, the, in the experience in God, he, uh, Henry shares a wonderful story about a church that's getting ready to disband. At one time, it was a vibrant and alive church. But the community started changing. Things started differing. But they kept, if he tells you the whole story, um, which you don't, you don't get a, a snippet of it, is the church doesn't adapt to the changes around them. They keep doing things the exact same way, even though it does not meet any of the needs of the people, which means the church is not meeting, it's not joining God where he's working. They're still working off some formula instead of joining God. And so the numbers drop, the numbers drop, the numbers drop, and now they're ready to disband. And so the, this small group of people said, I'll tell you what, we're going to do the Experience in God series. And then they said, they start praying, Lord, show us where you're working. Just show us where you're working. And then all of a sudden, the apartment manager comes over to the church one day and knocks on the door and says, listen, we have issues with these kids. Could you help with the kids? You know, some churches say, oh, no, we're just too busy. I'm sorry, but go back to the prayer. Oh, Lord, just show us where you're working. If you give us some kind of sign where you're working, 
And, but they said, okay, now they're a small group. Let's start working with these kids. And the, the department manager said, you can use our facilities. We have a community room. Come in there. And they go in there and they start working with the kids. And then they still see a need for single mothers while they're working with these kids. They see, oh, God needs. And so they start working with single mothers. And then drug addicts start coming to the church. And this church that was ready to disband all of a sudden is starting ministries and reaching out because they said, God, let us join you. Instead of making our agenda, let's make your, let's follow your agenda. But what Henry leaves out, and I wish he did, he'll probably hit it later on, is one part of the story that's really missing, it was hard work. These people had to change their lives. It wasn't like, yes, we'll just, yes, I'll find magical time in my day to start helping these children. But those children became a priority. So they were going to change their schedule to help those children. And then help those single moms and help those drug addicts. If we think it's going to easily fit into our schedule, then we don't want to join God where he's working. We want God to join us in our schedule. Because there is going to be inconvenience. There's no doubt about it. When I worked as a uh, consultant to churches, I had a pastor who met with me. who uh, I was willing to help him in a few areas. And basically I gave him what I do and what I've done and it's sort of like a resume, and he's looking at it, and he asked me, he says, Jim, you padded this resume. I said, what do you mean I padded it? He goes, there's no way you did all this. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it says, well, you planted this church, and you're a pastor of this church. I said, yes. And then you were also the president of the Downtown Associates of North Attleboro. I said, yes, the downtown organization. We're trying to keep them vibrant and alive. I worked with them. I was the president. He said, but you were also the chaplain of the CEO club in Boston. I said, well, I was the unofficial chaplain of the CEO Club in Boston. I said, yes. He said, and then you were on the board of Oasis of Peace starting an orphanage in Kenya. I said, yes, I was involved with that. I was doing that. Yes, I was doing this all at once. Plus, you're raising your kids. You have a wife. I said, yes, I was. He said, how did you do all that? How did you find time? I said, I don't know. I said, but I do know if you join God where he's working, man, he makes it possible. I got the opportunity because I walked through each door to talk to hundreds, if not thousands of people about Jesus Christ. Kristen used to make a joke. We'd drive home where we used to live in Massachusetts, and we always passed this one house where there's a big picture window, and there's a guy in a recliner watching television. And Kristen used to say, I wonder what that's like. I don't know what that's like. Because the priority wasn't six hours of television at night or on our computer. Our, what was on our heart is the will of God. And while doing all this, we were at all our kids' events. I, there was none event my kid did that I wasn't there for. But as long as we want to have it easy or fit into our schedule, you're in trouble. It's not going to work. None of that stuff fit into my schedule. So I had to change my life. Even now, I've been praying for a year. God put in my heart to reach out to men. And God says, I'm going to unfold it for you. I'm going to unfold it for you. And I've had to wait and wait and wait. And now he's unfolding in, in uh, the, net, uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center wants to imp uh, hire a part-time man to be the, a fatherhood counselor to reach the men. And I'm looking at doing this. But that's 20 hours of my week. If I, if they, if, if I can job, they want to hire me. So now I'll pastor here and spend 20 hours helping young men who are being fathers for the first time. How do you fit that into your schedule? I don't know, but God does. Chris is already working with me. Okay, we're going to have to change this in our schedule, and that's in your schedule. You're going to have to move this over here, move this over there to fit it in. I've been asking God to join him, and he's had me waiting. And I, even I told the pregnancy center, even if you don't hire me, that's fine. I will still volunteer every week to help out whoever you hire. I will be here every week helping out whoever the head coordinator is. I don't care who it is. It's where God's working. I need to be here. I've been praying about this for a year. And he's put it in my heart. He's had me wait and wait and wait. I think it's time that I stop waiting. And then I pulled Nat into it. And Nat's like, yeah, I'd like to join you in this venture. And so he and I are trying to put a platform together to do things not only for there but for here to reach out to young men. We're going after the men that never come to church, the 20-somethings. Don't ever – you've watched the history of the church. They get to 18, they leave the church, and maybe if they get married and have kids, they'll come back. But that 20-somethings do not come to church. 
So we're going after a demographic that's not possible to get. And I love going after the impossible. And I'm just trying to join God where he's working. It's not convenient. It's not easy. But if we want it convenient and easy, then we don't want God. And that's why Christianity is a tough sell. Because everyone, I mean, we could be a much larger church if I just told you, yeah, you can be a millionaire. and God wants you to be wealthy. You can have a Rolls Royce like me. It's all about you. That sells much better than give up your time, your effort to join God where he's working. And it's a difficult thing. We have to decide what we're going to do with it or not do with it. I mean, in Amos 3, 7, Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants and prophets. In Matthew 6, 33 and 34, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do you think it's any mistake that God said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? And then after that verse put, don't worry about tomorrow? <laughs> if you're going to seek my kingdom, my righteousness, your time's going to get filled up with reaching people. In my life, I've had people in the church telling me we didn't have a youth program or a children's program, and so they'd have to leave. I said, well, you can start it. You have a child. No, no, I want to go where it's already at. I'm like, oh, so you want to go someplace where a person didn't have the attitude that you have right now. We're at church somewhere where some guy says, they don't have this, so I'm going to start it. And he stayed, and he worked, and he labored. But no, no, you don't want that. You want to be spoon-fed. You just want to give in to you. You just want to take Basically, yes. Hmm. Interesting. You get the benefits of someone who didn't have your attitude. I said, God's will, I'll do. It happens in church all the time. I mean, in 2 Timothy 1 7, God said, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self discipline. What do we think about Jesus? Jesus was incredibly courageous. I mean, Jesus was bold. He, he was a man. In every term of that word, he was a man. He walked into the lion's den, not literal lion's den. He walked in where he was hated, and he did not hesitate. He took on the Pharisees and Sadducees. He called them whitewashed tombs. There's a book um, I've just ordered. I want to read it. I found it intriguing. I was listening to the author. I'm like, oh, you're great. He said, we have to get the nice guys out of the church. Like, the nice guy, no. He says, what the nice guy is, is a guy where someone will tell their sin, and say, oh, that's okay. Instead of confronting a sin, instead of dealing with the issue, they're just nice. And he was jokingly saying, Jesus wasn't nice. He didn't have a sin, and he wasn't going to say, it's okay. He didn't say, it's sin. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to show you that's sin. And we're, if we're going to be called to do the work of God, it takes a courageous spirit it, timidity will not make it. It takes boldness to do the work of God. And I'll just end with a story that I enjoy. Um, this uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I'm going to be in Massachusetts. I'll be back Saturday night. And uh, they're having an event for my father, so we're going to go out there and attend there. And while there on Friday, uh, there's uh, the biker church we help plant. Uh, 12 years ago, uh, has their service on Friday. So I told Tom, I said, I'm going to be in the area. I'd like to go to the service. I haven't been there in years. And Tom's like, could you come and speak, Jim? I said, listen, I, you're going through a book of Revelation. I'll do a 10-minute thing, and, uh, and then you can preach. And he said, okay. He goes, what are you going to talk on? I said, I'm going to talk on about you and uh, your wife, Debbie. He's like, oh, I'll enjoy that. I said, you will. I don't know anyone else will, but you will. Tom came to me, tw it was 22 years ago. It would be 22 years ago. He had left, he was an elder at church, and he showed up at my church, and I knew Tom. And, he, and I said, Tom, what are you doing here? You're an elder at your church. He said, yeah, I left. I said, well, let me call your pastor, and they called his pastor. And I said, listen, I got Tom here. Is there any reconciliation that's needed? Has something gone wrong? He says, no, 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 everything's fine, everything's fine. 
He said, Tom's a maverick, and I just don't know how to corral a maverick. I said, oh, you don't corral mavericks. That kills their spirit, kills their passion. It just defeats them. I said, you take that maverick and you take that energy and you learn to point it in a good direction. And that strength and energy they have will do wonderful, wonderful things. And so the pastor said, well, you seem to understand this better than me so you can have them. And I'm like, I would love to have Tom. And so Tom and Debbie, he and his wife came. And Tom came to me and said, Jim, I really, I see God working with bikers. And he was a biker. He came from a background with drugs, alcohol, bikes. I mean, terrible background. Came to Christ, did the 180. <laughs> Just an amazing man of God. Divorced two tw- twice because he says, as he says, I would have divorced me. Um, came to the Lord, found his wife. Wonderful marriage, amazing woman. I mean, they're a great couple. Uh, just love them dearly. And he said, I want to reach bikers. He goes, but I don't want to reach, because all the Christians, Biker groups just reach Christians. I want to go after the one percenters, the outlaws, the hell's angels. I want to go after them. And I'm like, oh, you're a wonderful man. That's great. And he said, but I just want to do this. I said, sounds great, Tom. We're on board. Let us know how we can help you. He said, well, the problem is bikers meet on Sunday. I said, yes, why is that an issue? He said, well, pastors want you in church on Sunday. I said, are the bikers in church on Sunday? He said, no, then I don't want you in church on Sunday. He said, like, you were the first pastor to say that. I said, well, I'm the first pastor, pastor stupid enough to try things like this. I said, but three rules. One, you can't do it by yourself. And he said, no, my wife wants to do it with me. I said, great. Two, you have to be discipled by me. We have to meet regularly on your discipleship. Three, what other day of the week are we going to minister to you? Give me a day of the week. You cannot just not be at church. Give me another day of the week we're going to minister to you. He said, Tuesday. I said, great. It may just be me, you, and, me and you, Deb, and Kristen, but we're going to minister to you. I will give you my sermon I preach on Sunday, uh, but we're going to minister to you. He said, great. Well, the music team responded and said, well, we'll play. I said, well, yeah, I'm going to just do my sermon I did on Sunday. They're like, you never preach the same sermon twice. We're not worried about it. I said, okay. And I, said, so I said, Tom, it will be you and Deb and the music team. He said, Fantastic. Well, other people in church said, well, can we attend? I'm like, no. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to attend this service. So we had the church, basically everyone on Sunday showed up on Tuesday too. We're, tw- Monday and Tuesday, we're meeting to help this ministry. Well, what would happen is Tom started pulling people, other bikers who are Christians, into his group to minister. And our Tuesday group all of a sudden had a new look to it. We had a lot more leather <laughs> on Tuesday, all these leather jackets and vests and stuff. It was a fantastic time. But Tom had an excavation business. He and Deb, actually, Deb was an excavator too. Uh, he, they worked all week long in their business. As a matter of fact, there's many times I'd call Tom and I said, hey, Tom, how you doing? His thing was, another great day to be me. I'm sitting in a septic tank right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and there's more than one time I got him in a septic tank. And... And he, but he worked all day long. Now, they, this is their marriage. They both had been divorced and because they, weren't, they didn't know the Lord. Then they knew the Lord. She had two children. He had three children. So he's working all day in his, in, as an excavator, raising his kids, spending parts of his nights every week reaching these bikers who aren't being reached by anyone except him and his wife. And that group is growing, so he's spending time. On Sundays, he's there ministering to them. Then they're having events, so he joins in helping them with their events. He pulls other people to help them join events. One day he calls me and says, Jim, the Indians are having an event on Sunday. They don't have enough volunteers. Could you help? I said, sure. We closed the church down on Sunday to go and volunteer at this biker event. And one of the funniest part of that event is they had a hatchet throw. And the people running the hatchet throw were these two elderly ladies, like 70 years old, in charge of the hatchet throw. I just laughed hysterically. That's what they wanted to do. Can we do the hatchet throw? I'm like, yes. And so you have all these bikers walking up to these two women who look like grandmothers in the stereotypical grandmother, handing them hatchets. Saying, Here you go, sweetie. Here you <laughs> it's, just, it's a riot. I'm like, oh, Lord, this is fantastic. And one guy came up to his part of the, who was helping Tom, came up to me and said, Jim, I cannot believe you closed your church down today. I said, well, that's really not a true statement. I said, we were having church here today. I said, I still have people back at the church praying for us right now. So during this event, I have people at the church, and they're going to stay at the church praying 
until we get done with this event. But we are having church. Just It looks a little different today. And Tom just kept pouring into these people. At Christmas time, Debbie would make 50 dozen cookies and go to each clubhouse and drop off cookies to Tom. He did this for 10 years. 10 years. And then one day he says, Jim, I think we need to make a biker church. I said, it sounds great. Let's sit down and talk. He said, yes, I need to be ordained. Can you ordain me? I said, yes, in two more years. He's like, what? I said, you're not ready. I said, you're close. Let's turn this in high gear. Within two years, I'll be able to ordain you. I said, but you are not ready yet to be ordained. And he was upset with me. Now, he and I like to joke about this now. We talk about it regularly. He said, yeah, in a church today, if you do something like that, someone says, God told me that I should be ordained, that God has laid it out, and you don't do it right away, you're supposed to leave the church. Not only do you leave the church, you get on Twitter or on Facebook, and you say how terrible the pastor is, how short-sighted the church is. You try to split the church, and you leave. Tom sat with me. After I, I gave him, I said, I'll, I'll do it. You, you, yes, you can be ordained. I said, you're just not ready. You're not there yet, but you're close. You're close. And he left that meeting, and Chris, I came home to Chris, and Chris was like, how's he doing? I said, he's not happy with me, I know that. And I was afraid I was going to lose my friend. And so he called me up and said, will you have dinner with Deb and I? Can you and Kristen come over? I said, sure. So we went over, not knowing what to expect. And I sat down with Tom, and I said, Tom, so what, what's up? He said, let's get on the two-year plan. I want to be ordained. Show me what I have to do. I'm going to do it. I said, okay, you're excavating, you're reaching these bikers, and now you're ready to take on this journey of becoming an ordained pastor, plus raise your kids and be a husband. He's like, yes. I said, let's do it. And as he's telling me his story, Deb's like, oh, no, 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 no. His wife says, give him the whole story. And Tom's like, what whole story? <laughs> give him the whole story. He's like, okay. Deb's like, I think Deb said, I'll tell the story. So Tom came home, and he was upset. Jim says I can't be ordained. Jim says I'm not qualified. Jim says he's not going to help me. And Deb says, I, that doesn't sound like Jim. He doesn't talk that way. Give me his exact words. I want his exact words. He said I wasn't ready, but he walked with me. Ah, it sounds like he thinks you should be a pastor. It sounds like he does want to support you. And Tom's like, it's amazing what we won't hear when we have our own agenda in our head. He said, your desire was for God's will. My desire was for my will. God let me know he wanted me to be ordained, but I went in on my timetable, not on God's. And obviously, I have the wrong timetable. And people ask, how did you two stay such good friends? Because we butted heads on a num num numerous occasions. He and I would just butt heads. He was, at the time, it's so comical. If you, I wish you knew him. I have told him, if you're ever down in this area, I'm going to have you preach. He was big on emotions. Emotions just get in the way. They just get in the way. He said, you know, they're just hindrances. So he was pretty much a black and white guy and would roll right over you. You know, it, and he would beat you with the scriptures to try and make you a Christian. I'm like, Tom, these people have things called feelings, and you have to be aware of that. You can't just sort of yell at them. You, you have to at time coax them along. But Jim, it takes so long. Yes, it does sometimes. <laughs> and if you met him today, he's this very emotional guy that God has just transformed uh, into get, get him to his And he'll joke about that. Oh, I'm having these feeling things. <laughs> They're getting in the way. They're getting in the way. I just watched God change this man. But people said, how did you guys who butted heads so many times how would you stay friends? And how are you still such good friends today? It was simple. When God's will is what binds you, everything else is put in perspective. Tom and I have a heart to do God's will. And that bound us. So our budding heads, we saw what they were, that big. And God's will was this big.
we're able to keep it in perspective. So when we disagreed, we didn't get mad at each other. Matter of fact, he had a time where he said, Jim, I, I was meeting with the, my board saying, I want to do this. And he's like, no, 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 you're not going to do that. And I said, I think I should, no. And he looks at the board. I'm saying, no, what do you guys think? And they're like, we agree with Tom. I said, okay, then. I'm not going to do that. We were in, we're bound by God's will. And that made it possible for us to keep loving each other and walking with each other. Going through hard and difficult times together. I love that man. He became my armor bearer. He came to me and said, I want to be your armor bearer. If anyone in the church attacks you, they've got to deal with me. I'm going to be on the front lines taking every arrow that's coming at you. And I'm like, Tom, every pastor prays for this. And so when he became a pastor of his church, first my answer was, I think that's a really bad idea. You should stay with me because I like you as my armor bearer. <laughs> but my prayer for him is God will give you an armor bearer that you will get a Tom like I had a Tom and what that meant to me. But what I loved about Tom is his run after God's, God's will, God's will, God's will. And he gave up so much for it. So 10 years, it turns into a church. It's, it's been a church for 12 years. The last two years, we finally received the salary. After 20 years of doing God's will, we finally received a salary. How many people are going to stay at God's will for 20 years? Have to keep working jobs, stretching yourself like this. He's 66 years old. His wife has had breast cancer twice. He has medical issue. He has an uh, immunology issue where he has to go every month to the hospital to get he calls his transfusion so he can function. 22 years. I'm like, man, I'm in awe of you. He's like, how? He, we were talking this week. He said, I don't understand how people can't do God's will. I don't get it. I don't get why people keep focusing on saying things like, I don't have time. I'm not available. I don't get that. He said, whatever place would you rather be than in God's will? I, all I know is when Tom and Deb go to see the Lord, there's going to be a whole line of witnesses saying, I know Jesus Christ because they said yes to God's will. There's going to be a line, person after person after person. I came to know Jesus Christ because they said yes to God's will. It'll be far as the eye can see. And I think, do I have a line? Do we have a line? Because if you're in God's will, you have a line. Because he's going to call you to serve others. He'll never call you to serve yourself. And the blessing you get when, the, when you finish your day, you know you served him. And that's the question I ask. As you looked at your last week or two, if you could reflect on it, were they good days? The end of your day saying, yeah, I served God well today. This week I served God well. I was in his will this week, this day. One of the prayers I do with Kristen almost every morning is that we would serve God well today. God wants us in his will. He desires it. He tells us he'll join us. He says, abide in me, and you will bear fruit. Stay with me, you will bear fruit. It's a promise. But we have to get out of about me, it's about him. God's will. And I like Walt Blackaby because he makes us think this way. He's going to challenge us and push us. For the next 12 weeks, he's going to get into all these different steps of you're going to come to a crisis of faith. You, you're going to be hit hard if you want to do it. This study I love because it more opened my eyes more than any study I did of how I was still surrounded with my will and what I thought was good and doing it the way I thought it should be done and having to step in into, okay, God, it's you. It's you and nothing. So I'm um, praying that you'll enjoy it, the study. Um, next uh, Sunday, um, Mike will be speaking on week two. Um, I'll be here, but 
since I'll be in Massachusetts part of the week, Mike's got it week two, and he's going to be sharing about the next step of this. And if I can't encourage you enough to do this work, though, to, to spend every, there's five days a week, you just spend it looking to God's will for your life. You're never too old for it, you're never too young for it. And it's a beautiful thing. Because if we're going to be a church, it makes a difference. We'll be in God's will. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And if a church that isn't in God's will, you really don't want to be there. It's really best to go elsewhere. So this is going to be our prayer. That God's going to reveal his will to us each time we come up to see him. He's starting to reveal it, pardon me, as Nat joining me. As we roll this out, if the other men want to join us, you're welcome to join us, but you can't join us and expect to do nothing. We're going to be working to reach these men, mainly fathers, new fathers, and then name after them. And figure out, God, how do we reach them? And let God unfold it for us. So that's something that's put on my heart and it's about to come about, it looks like. It's coming about one way or another. So, um, But God may reveal something to you where he's working. Just keep praying for his will. Just keep praying. And he will reveal. Jesus did the will of God. He left paradise, heaven, came to earth as a man emptied himself, the scriptures tells us, basically became nothing, you know, the will of the Father to save us. So Christ came here, died for us, showed us how to live a life of rich fulfillment. And then before he was crucified, he gave us communion, showing what it looks like when you do the will of God. So we'll take the bread and cup, we'll, we'll hand it out to you. you. Just hold on to it. You can take time of prayer to seek forgiveness, to actually start asking God, I don't know what your will is. Or 